We have a joy here this morning. Where is he? I did see him walk in the back. Oh, there you are. How's uh, your sister doing? Fantastic. I cared for her in intensive care uh, 12 months ago, Christmas time. Actually, in fact, Christmas Day. And uh, it was uh, being away from my family. It was lovely to care for someone else's family on that day. And David was in there. It's always good to hear follow up because we don't hear these things. Um, why don't we pray? Can someone pray for uh, what was what was her name again? Margaret. Margaret. Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, can someone pray maybe, Dad? Can you pray for Margaret? And uh, then pray for the service as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, with great joy we can come into your presence. And Lord, we especially think of the mercies that we have through life. We remember Margaret at this time. We lift her up before you for your continued hand to be upon her healing. And Lord, strength, we just thank you for that which the healing that's happened over this last year. Lord, we commit this service to you. You are a good and a gracious God as we think back of the various missionaries we support and your hand upon their lives and we think it on our own lives. For you would have each of us personally to respond to you and to, to hear from you. So as we gather around your word there, we ask your blessings in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> For those that have been trekking along, we've been going through the book of Hebrews and... Um, I've sort of been taking my time through the first chapter, sorry, the first few verses of Hebrews 11. And this year, we're going to be starting up a, a, a series in the, in, on Sunday night. And so I've, ta- I've taken take the opportunity and raced through chapter 11 today and raced through chapter 12 and chapter 13 so we can uh, start this um, series coming up. So that's what we'll be doing uh, this morning. But what circumstances in life do you fear the most? I'm sure with varied ages here and experiences here, we would all have different things that we could share. Maybe it's, maybe it's a loss of a job or loss of income or finances. Um, just before I got married, as you went after, as you, as, when I got married, um, I was on a contract at work and being renewed and we just bought a house and um, my contract was getting close and I can remember chatting to my father-in-law about it. It was getting down to the last week and I hadn't heard if I had a job and um, uh, it can be quite a stressful time and graciously uh, God has provided me work and I'm now permanent. But sometimes that, those sorts of things can, can stress us. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's something that, that you fear is going to debilitate you through life. You know, if I hurt my back, I'm not going to be able to do this. Or if I, um, uh, you know, lose something else, I can't do this in my employment. Um, or maybe I just can't play with my kids. Um, or I just can't get out and keep a healthy lifestyle that I would like. Um, or maybe it might mean that you'll be bedridden for a high proportion of your time. Maybe it's losing a loved one in your life. Maybe someone that you've grown dependent upon, someone who's always been there for you. They've always spoken truth into your life. They've counselled you when you've needed it most. And uh, they're going to be with the Lord. And maybe that's what's fearful. Maybe it's not the big life-changing things that we're just talking about that unsettle you, but it's the little Things that compound into big things throughout the day. You're fearful of that, of that coffee stain on your shirt in the morning just as you're racing out to work or to that function because that will offset all these little compounding things that end up making a terrible day. Uh, maybe it's not a coffee stain. Maybe it's, um, in Darren's case, it's the, or in Noel's case, it's the, um, 
It's the baby chucking on the shirt just as you're holding it as you're racing out the door. Maybe it's something like that. Um, but it's these sorts of circumstances that, that are going to test the fabric of our soul. How do you respond in these varied sorts of circumstances? We're all going to have them in varied ways, in various, various measures. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is addressing people who are going through some really tough times. Actually, the whole book of chapter of Hebrews is, is addressing people who are going through really tough times. In the first 10 chapters, the writer puts before these people uh, and says, Jesus is better. He's better than anything else that you could experience. The Old Testament sacrifices, he's a better priest. You know, Jesus is better. He's a better messenger. messenger. Trust in him. Look to him. Don't go to anything else. But these people under the heat of various circumstances were not trusting in God. And some even to the point of rejecting Jesus and going back to what was familiar and comfortable, namely their Judaistic um, religion. And at the end of chapter 10, we looked at this probably a few months back, but the writer pleads with his audience, don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on Jesus because there's dire circumstances if you do. You see in verses 35, he says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience. But notice his claim of these people in verses 39. He says, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or to destruction, but of them that believe, or those that have faith, this is the same word, to those that have faith to the saving of the soul. He says, We're not these people if indeed we have saving faith. If we have saving faith, we're not these people that draw back. To destruction. This is where chapter 11 verses 1 steps in. There's not a break in thought here. He's not all of a sudden transitioning to a different subject. Now we're going to look at the big chapter of faith. Remember what he's just said because he's going to go in and step into that. And he said, just before you rush in and say, I'm part of this group or I'm a believer, I've said the prayer. He says, let me clarify what sort of faith I'm talking about. Those that actually believe to the saving of the soul. Let me, let me draw some pictures and some clarification for you. So the big idea of chapter 11 is this. Men and women were deemed people of faith by simply trusting in God and living that conviction in any circumstance. Men and women were deemed people of faith by simply trusting in God and living that conviction in any circumstances. Chapter 11 isn't a chapter of superhuman beings. God didn't offer these people more help than he offers us. They weren't perfect either. The point of chapter 11 isn't to analyse the perfections or imperfections of these people, but it's what they're modelling in in their particular circumstances. So let's have a look. We're up to chapter chapter 11, and we're just going to go from verses 17, and we're going to race through to the end of the chapter. But we'll just, we'll just take little bits at a time. Verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, uh, that, um, of whom it was said that Isaac shall be the seed, shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was even able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him back in a figure. Abraham's faith was seen in his willingness to offer up this child of promise, a a child that God had promised to him and hand the child into God's care because he believed that God could raise him back up from the dead if he wanted to, if that's what he had done. What an amazing faith in the unknown handing something precious over to God. Now, I'm not quite sure we'd be confronted with that, but someone tells me that a kid's first day at school is 
can be quite distressing, handing a child over to, uh, to the unknown on a far lesser scale, I'm sure. But um, it's this unknown. We don't know what's going to happen, whether they're going to be okay. We just trust that God can do what he wants to do. Look at verses 20 and 21. We'll keep pushing through. And by faith, Isaac uh, blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Jacob and Isaac had faith in the future blessings of God. They trusted that God had made promises, he was going to fulfill them, and so therefore they could bless people into the future. Here's something unseen, but you're certain it will happen. Maybe you've been wronged, but you know that God's just and he will deal with sin. Faith lets you act in forgiveness and love. Faith lets you trust in something you actually know to be true and going to happen. And then faith lets you act accordingly. Look at verses 22. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. We're not going to spend, we're not going to, we're not going to overanalyze all of these little stories here, but Joseph still had faith that his people were going to go back into the promised land. They're currently in Egypt. And he says, look, one day God's promised us this land. We're going to head back there. We're not there now. It looks like it's going to be a long way away. But it's in my bones back there because I believe that God's given us this land and this is where we're heading. He had faith in the promise of God. Look at verses 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child or he, was, he had found uh, favoured or he was uh, beautiful. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. I spent a bit of time thinking through this because it seems quite... Com- when you read it at first, it doesn't sound like his parents had faith. Surely if they trusted in God, um, why would they... they say, and he says they're not afraid of the king's commandment. Why would they hide the child? Why not just be open about it, trusting in God? It's quite complexing, isn't it? But Moses' parents displayed faith by displaying the hope in God's plan for their son. I want you to notice something key about their faith. Even though they knew God had plans for Moses and they were not afraid of what the king commanded, they still hid the child and we pointed that out. Faith doesn't mean you step back and do nothing. Like you need a job and you'll just uh, sit back trusting that God will drop one into your lap. Or maybe you've lost your keys and, well, I'm not going to search for them because I have faith that they'll turn up just when I need them. Faith in God will often do all the humanly necessary elements, but leave the results and trust in the results up to God. Faith in God will often do all the humanly necessary elements, but leave the results and trust in the results up to God. Verses 24 to 28, and now we're pushing through. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. There's so much in in these few verses that we could stop and look at. But Moses, by faith, chose to identify himself with with God's people and their God and took on the reproach that came with it. That's a big step of faith and trust in the God of um, Abraham and Isaac. But I notice something else here in, in Moses' faith. Um, Moses also, by faith, celebrated the Passover even before seeing the deliverance it would bring. He painted the, the uh, doorpost red, remember that? 
And uh, he trusted that what God had said, and when he passes over, if he sees the blood on the doorposts, uh, that your family will be safe. He believed that. And so as ridiculous as it may have seemed, seems, he did it. And God was true to his word. And um, uh, he trusted in God even before it happened. Look at verses 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as seen by dry land when the Egyptians um, are saying to do were drowned. Is this, have I got a bit of feedback here or something? Just turn, maybe just turn this one on. Be fine, I won't wander away. This is kind of ridiculous as well, but people walked through a wall of water. People trusted. That would take a bit of faith. It's kind of, you know, this hasn't happened before and little water's up on either side pressing in and we're just going to walk through and... But it took faith. People trusted that God was going to protect them. Maybe they learnt from putting the blood on the doorposts. It seems funny. God's promised to protect us if we do this. Let's just step out in faith and do it. So maybe they learnt from that experience. And I'm not sure. Verses 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven Days. This is also probably something silly as well. As silly as it sounds, to walk around the city seven times blowing your horn. I mean, just imagine behind the wall they've got swords and spears and weaponry looking at them, thinking, what are these people They're just walking around blowing their horns? And I can't imagine them those horns being quite musical either. They just would have a blaring noise. But God had told them to do it. They trusted in him and they did it. Um, what an amazing step of faith verses 31 by faith the harlot Ray had perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace with peace Rahab trusted in the God of the Israelites even before the destruction of Jericho had happened she knew that God had given the Israelites the land she trusted in that she'd heard it and so she trusted in the God of the Israelites. So she had faith. Verses 32. This is sort of the preacher's curse. I was discussing about it um, a week ago. There's always uh, not enough time to... My father-in-law would sympathise for this as his uh, um, messages sometimes go quite long. But um, uh, there's never enough time to say everything that you want, want to say. And so the, the, the writer sort of breaks out. Um, and what more should I say for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, and of uh, Jephthah, of David, and of Samson, Samuel, and of the prophets. So his intention here isn't to, isn't to cover every particular detail here. His intention here is just to give you a flavour of what faith looks like in varied circumstances. And we, if, if I had time, I would break down all these stories down and then if this particular circumstance relates to maybe something this we might experience. And that might be a helpful exercise to do. And maybe that's something good for you to do later on this week as you think about how would this circumstance relate to me, similar to what we did uh, in the first couple verses. But let's keep moving on. Verse 33 to um, 38 and we've already had this we've already had this read so maybe we won't reread this again but we're going to get people he's going to cover men and women who responded in faith during times of blessing and also respond in faith in times of immense, hard, immense hardship torture and even death it can sometimes be just as hard to respond in faith when everything seems to be going well. Oftentimes that's when people walk away from God. They take credit for things that are happening. They lose their trust in God and they start going their own way. But these people, in times of blessing, trusted in God and maintained that. And then people who were also sawn in two and uh, were taken to death also trusted in God 
And the writer sort of concludes this section in verses 39 to 40. He wants to give us a challenge and an encouragement here. Let's, we, will, we will read these ones again. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided something better, um, some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now we remember these are just normal people that trusted in God, but they did so without experiencing and possessing a fraction of the blessings that you and I have and experience. These people trusted in God without receiving even a fraction of what you and I have today. God's provided something better for us, namely the new covenant realities that we do experience, what he was talking about here, a superior priesthood, the Holy Spirit, the complete revelation of God, and I could go on. And in one way, this exemplifies their faith. In one way, this shows that these people in chapter 11 who didn't experience that still had faith in God. It somehow deepens their faith. But it's also a challenge to us. How is it a challenge to us? Do you remember the, the story in Matthew 20 where uh, the master of a vineyard goes out and um, he has all these grapes that need to be picked and he's looking for workers. So he goes out early in the morning and he finds some people there that are willing to work and they agree, sign the contract uh, of this is how much you're going to get paid for today and they start working. And as they're starting to work, he soon realises that there's a lot more grapes here than I thought and it's not going to need more workers than I've got. So he goes out uh, later on in the day and gets more workers and they, he says, look, I'll pay you what's fair. Um, so just, you, know, you just need to trust that I'll give you what, what is right. So they start working away and soon realises that, that there's still more grapes than, than uh, possibly uh, these workers will be able to pick. So there's only a few hours left in the day, so he's going to go out and I'm just going to get anyone to work if they can and people come in, work for a couple hours of the day and he says, look, I'll pay you, fair, dot, dot, dot. At the end of the day, all the grapes are picked and um, uh, the workers come up and... Uh, he pays the, um, the people that started at the start of the day their, their full day's work. And he goes through and pays everyone exactly the same amount. The people that only worked a couple hours got paid a full day's work. And the people who started at the start of the day and worked hard in the hot sun, they busted their backs doing this, were like, you know, moaning and groaning, what's this? This isn't fair. This isn't right. This shouldn't happen. Read the story if you want to find out what Jesus says to them. But in regards to the blessing, blessings of God, where are the people who have only worked a couple of hours but are getting paid the full amount? Their faith which clung on to hope and our faith which experiences much of that hope end up with the same results. End up with the same results. Being the one family of God, we will all together partake in resurrected, perfected bodies. We will all be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, living in the very presence of God forever. What a challenge for us to be people of faith. Hebrews 11 is really meant to be a challenge for us to persevere in life by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We'll see that in the next next sermon where it says, Therefore, seeing we're surrounded by all these people in chapter 11, lay aside these things and look to Jesus and cling to him. We'll we'll, we'll take take a bit of time on those three or four verses because there's a lot in there. But what I want to focus on this morning before we sort of wrap up is the challenge for us to allow trusting God to influence our actions in any circumstance. Men and women were deemed people of faith by simply trusting in God and living that conviction in any circumstance. What we think about circumstances will affect how we respond in circumstances. 
what we think about circumstances will affect the way we respond in circumstances. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God. It's not saying that all things are good. It's not saying that all things should happen. But that God has an all-wise and all-good end behind everything. James 1, 2 to 3 says, Consider trials in your life as joy, because it's an opportunity to test your faith and grow. Test your faith in God and grow. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves therefore before God by casting all your cares and your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Even if you don't feel it, even if you don't feel like he's there and he cares for you, he does. And that's faith. The people in Hebrews 11 didn't have Romans. They didn't have James. They didn't have 1 Peter. They didn't have the words of Jesus speaking insight and truth into their circumstances like we do. But they were just men and women who were deemed people of faith by simply trusting in God and knowing that he had it under control. And they lived that conviction in the circumstances that they were in. What circumstances in life do you fear the most? When we started off thinking about this. Let's be a model of faith to our friends, to our kids, to our neighbours, to our work colleagues, to our teammates. Just like Hebrews 11 has people modelling that faith for us. Now I often don't do this, but I'm going to do it this morning. Last Sunday morning when I got home from night duty, um, I often sit down and, and be, let me hear me out. I often sit down and listen to Joel Osteen on TV, um, just out of interest. Now, I know 99.999% of what he says is prosperity gospel and seeker-friendly and, and pop good, feel-good pop psychology that's sending people to hell. I know that. I know that. I'm not swallowing everything that he says. However, he said this, and I thought it was really good. And so I want to share it with you uh, this morning. And listen to what he says, to judge the man on what he said, not on everything else. I'm just going to paraphrase here for a minute. Just imagine, it, if, 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 you, if you're having trouble with this, imagine it wasn't him that said it, all right? Maybe that might help. He said, don't let... What you know about God diminish or negate what you do know to be true about God. Don't let what you know about God diminish or negate what you do know to be true about God. In other words, we know God to be good in every circumstance, to always do what is right and just because his word says so. Don't let the unknown of that sickness that killed your friend Bring you down, bring down what you do know to be true about God. Don't let that financial struggle or negate the truth. God will always supply everything you need in life. There is some truth in that. Learn to file away the unknown and feared and cling on to truth. Learn to file away the unknown and feared in your life and cling on to truth. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. That's faith. We can all apply that here this morning. That is faith. I want to close by listening to a song that Susanna and I heard for the first time. We were driving, driving back from somewhere and we were quite sort of a bit discouraged and in need of encouragement and interestingly interestingly enough about 10 or 15 years ago someone gave me some CDs in the car and um, he said I have listened to some of these, it's got some good music on it and dot 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 and I never got around to listening to it that was 10, 15 years ago and I just just happened to 
uh, put them in my car and 90, 90% of Susanna was like, this is ghastly music and throw it out. I can't believe you even have this. And I said, I didn't even know I had it. But anyhow, we put it in and um, this song came up, interesting enough, and it was just uh, sort of was a real challenge and encouragement to us. And I guess in one way, we were, we were in need of trusting in the goodness of God in this particular circumstance. And so what I want you to do is, we're not going to close by singing a song. We're going to close by just listening, and the words will be up on the... I just got the words off you. I got the PowerPoint thing off YouTube. And so just think on the words, listen to the, listen to the song, and apply them to your own life. And I think, I think what the, the message of the song and how this ties into us being people of faith here at Southwest this morning is this. Is one way we can be people of faith is with gratitude, being explicitly thankful in every circumstance. One way we can be people of faith is with gratitude, being explicitly thankful in every circumstance. That's a step of faith. Thanks, Matt.